Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, I catch up with Millyard Racing about their new shock. Pivot onboard storage system. We check out the brand new TRP shifter and trail derailleur. And a very special new enduro bike from Acto5. Okay, so straight into news. And the first thing in news this week is the new TRP TR12 rear derailleur and shifter combination. Now we've previously seen the seven speed setup specific for downhill on Aaron Gwynn's bike. We've seen the prototype and we've seen the working ones. I've uh, got my hands on those at Eurobike and I've got two very specific features. There's that ratcheting clutch, which is like the strongest clutch I felt. Feels really good, uh, perfect for a silent bike. But actually, the thing that makes it incredibly silent, much more than any other system, is the hall lock, named after Gwyn's mechanic. So this is a little shot of that on screen at the moment. Um, his mechanic called John Hall wanted a system for locking effectively the B-tension part of the cage. So your B-screw or your B-tension, all it does is adjust the height of the upper jockey wheel in relation to your cassette. Once that's adjusted, there's no need really for the cage to pivot there. So he was like, well, once we're adjusted, why don't we just lock it? And then there's no way it can rotate basically and make noise. So that's exactly what it did on the downhill mech. And the TR12 now has that feature as well. So it's 12 speed compatible. It works with SRAM, with Shimano, with Sunracer, and with E13 cassettes. Uh, that's the order of recommendation um, directly from TRP. Um, here it is on the screen right now. It looks very cool, doesn't it? Like I said, it's got the hall lock on there. It's got the uh, ratcheting clutch. It's an adjustable clutch as well. So I think it's gonna be one of the most silent setups out there. So if noise bothers you, this could be really cool for you. Um, it's also got a couple of cool setup features that no one's done before that I think is really cool. So you've got little lineup markings on the actual derailleur in two different positions. Uh, one is for setting your B tension. So you look for the little chain emblem to, log to line up with the one on the actual cage. Very cool there, very simple. Reminds me of some SAG settings you see on some bikes. And also there's another set of markings on the uh, jockey cage or the pulley wheel cage uh, for setting your chain length. Brilliant. Why has no one done that before? Uh, I guess it's quite important on this particular one because of the cage lock system on there, but very cool nonetheless. Now the shifter looks nearly identical. Um, I haven't had my hands on one yet. There is one, was supposed to be here today in fact, but unfortunately a uh, delivery driver took it to the wrong place. Uh, so someone out there has got a very nice new set of TRP 12 speed. Um, it looks identical, in fact, to the 7-speed, except, of course, it's 12-speed. It has a 20-degree either-way adjustment of the main paddle shifter there, uh, the lever, so 40 degrees of movement. So you can actually get it in exactly the right position for you. It's always a little bit of a compromise trying to move around with like iSpec and the different SRAM systems to get them where you want. Uh, but this one, you should be able to get it exactly as you want. Uh, it looks very punchy. It looks like it works well. Uh, 330 US dollars is the price we've got here for them today. Uh, that is for the Mac and shifter combo, so not the cheapest, not the most expensive. Um, of course, Shimano Dior is very cheap at the moment, so it's going to be competing with that. But this is certainly a bit more of a higher performance thing, so perhaps it might be for you, um, or perhaps not. I certainly love the idea of the hall lock system on there, and I love a silent bike, so uh, I'll give it a thumbs up. Also, in the news this week, we see a new tooling system from Pivot. So, this is the Phoenix Dock Tool System which counterintuitively doesn't actually have much to do with their Phoenix downhill bike. And I suppose that'd be the one bike that wouldn't really be suitable because it goes off the bottle cage mounts. So the tools themselves are actually manufactured by Topeak and it's the ones that we use, which are really, really useful. Our ones go on the bottle cage or they can kind of attach at various points around your bike. But this one actually integrates really, really neatly on the underside of the top tube. So it's there to be, you know, ready whenever you need it. The idea being that instead of having um, the on-bike storage that's sometimes hidden inside compartments in the frame, maybe in the steerer, it's there straight away. And it does look very pricey. So you get the Ninja 16 Plus, the Ninja Toolbox Mini, and the Ninja CO2 version. And pricing goes from about 57 US dollars to 70. So you've got a couple of different tools there. I think my highlight is that 16 plus tool. It's got a carbon fiber cage. It's really, really, really light and incredibly versatile. It gets you out of pretty much all the situations you could envisage. The idea was supposedly inspired by NASCAR pit crews. Now to the extent of that, I can't attest, but the idea being that basically it's there when you need it. You get some that are kind of more compartmentalized inside the frame, maybe in the steerer, but this one is right there under, underneath the top tube, 
for your moment of need. Now I've been using the Topeak 16 Plus, which is a really tidy little tool because it's carbon fiber cage. It's very light, very versatile, and it has pretty much a tool for any occasion on it. And it is very useful because I never have to forget it. And you know, with this on-bike tool storage, I know a lot of people are thinking, just you know, put it in your pocket. Personally, I always get a little bit nervous about, I, I don't like having keys in my pocket just in case I land on them. And um, so having a big metal multi-tool kind of puts a bit of fear in me. So this seems to be a really good idea. Also, they have that Ninja CO2 system. Now, this is something we've talked about before with the Stan's Dart system. You know, basically how to, if you're in a, if you're in an XC race, how to get the air into your tires as quick as possible. And something like that seems pretty good. You could have it almost immediately on hand. But yeah, looks really cool. Good to see um, a company like Pivot kind of take on one of these things. I, I like to see bikes more integrated. And um, like I said, some companies like Specialized are doing that SWAT system compartmentalized. This is just another nice, neat solution for the problem, problem of how to carry our tools. Without a doubt, one of the coolest things we've seen on GMBM Tech recently has been the Milliard Racing Shock. Uh, of course, it was known as the Hyper Ride, but they've now just made a new one. This is it on screen. It's called the Hyper Ride 2. And look at this sticker. It says max pressure 4,200 PSI. That's insane, isn't it? Uh, so I got on a call to Stephen Milliard to find out a bit more. So you've been away from bikes for a while and uh yes and dad has basically come back into them in a pretty big way yeah so i yeah so i was racing a little bit i think 2015 2016. um i had a few issues with my bike that kind of put me off riding for a while and then we thought joe we're just gonna get back into it so i went out got a bike rode for about three weeks i was like this is way too bumpy like what's going on <laughs> so I rang my dad up and said, look, we need to make a shock for this bike. So we kind of got some old parts together and some old ideas and we, we chucked something together, which worked, proved the theory works on a you know, conventional bike. And then I've rode that for a little bit and then obviously everything's been locked down. So I, I rang him again and was like, let's make something completely new, like nothing we've done before. Let's just make something brand new. Let's try and make it look like nothing anybody's seen before, which I think it kind of looks pretty unique. It looks insane. So yeah, those pictures you sent me yeah. yesterday it look unreal. Yeah, so we're not using any of the technology that we used in the old suspension system now. Okay. We kind so of we've kind of done else. yeah, we've done some research and kind of found some interesting concepts that on paper look like they really don't work. And and have put it in and it performs. I was surprised I mean we I used my air conditioning like flow rate calculations to work out the damping size hole and like calculated it all out to what I thought it should be, rang my dad up and he said, that's good because I drilled it 0.05 of a millimeter less than that. Okay. So we were like, let's just go with it then and see. And we built it and I took the first run down the track and was like, it's perfect. We haven't made any adjustments to it or anything. We just got it right first time. You need a fast rebound to, obviously like you've seen with the slow-mos I sent you in, in the yeah. past, like you need a fast rebound to iron out any bumps. But with a fast rebound comes a hard top-out noise. Yeah, sure. So we had a lot of issues before with a hard top-out. So we've kind of re-engineered it in a way that gives you the fast fast rebound you need, but you don't get any top-out noise now. It's, it's gone completely. And how'd you get around um, getting kicked up the arse? It's, it just doesn't happen. I, I can't explain it. <laughs> it's like, I can push the seat down now and the back wheel will come like that far off the ground. It lifts the whole bike off the ground. Yeah. But that's no different to a car if you took the engine out. You know, the dampens, it works when you're on it. It doesn't need to work when you're not on it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and when you, it, the damping and the spring aren't separate. They are the same thing. So, in order for the spring to kick back fast, it needs to move the damping fast, which it can do. But if the forces are there, it can't do it. So if you do like a massive, you know, big drop, G right out, yeah. it'll just come back up and stop. It doesn't, it actually absorbs the shock rather than, like springs store the energy and give it back, don't they? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Whereas this will store, the, it doesn't store the energy. 
it will actually absorb the energy, convert it to heat, dissipate it, and then it's gone. And so that's why you've got the heat fins on the side of the shop. Yeah, yeah, because that, <laughs> we, we found that with, you know, as things get hotter, viscosity of oil will change, so your damping will change. And if you're, you know, fine tuning your damping, and we don't have any valves, shims, ports, anything in there. It's literally, I think, if you don't count, you know, like the bushes and that, I think it's four or five components in total. Uh, well, there you go. A little bit of a chat there with Stephen Milliard. In fact, I chatted to him for about 45 minutes, but uh, that was just a little snippet of that. Now, we're going to go and see him soon, as soon as lockdown kind of eases, because we've got some plans to test out that shock and find out what it's all about and how different it really is to modern shock absorbers. Uh, if you want to find out a bit more about what the Milliards are up to, uh, check out the YouTube channel. It's really cool, and you've got to see the stuff that Alan is doing. Uh, there's a link to that in the description underneath this. In the meantime, stay tuned and make sure you give them a follow on Instagram as well, actually. Uh, we can put Instagram handles underneath. So next up in the news is something that's going to get a few hearts racing. It is a new bike from a brand called Acto5. Acto5, I'm not entirely sure on the pronunciation. And it is the P-Train, which is kind of a trail or enduro bike. Now, this bike, just to look at it, is jaw-droppingly good looking. So what is this bike? Well, it's a high pivot trail bike with 130 or 140 mil travel at the back. It's got a Reynolds tubed front triangle paired to an absolutely beautiful CNC'd rear end. Now, if you actually watch the launch video, you can see the process, you know, from them welding the front triangle to doing the machining on the rear end. And it just looks fantastic. It looks really, really good. And not only obviously you can see the whole process being made, but they will be manufactured in Germany. Now looking at the numbers, and they certainly seem very healthy, they actually stipulate this is for a medium. So you know, take that into account because the reach is 480. You've got a seat tube angle of 77 degrees, a head tube angle of 66 degrees. And very interestingly actually, they give their chainstay length at two different, um, two different settings. So, You've got your change their length unweighted in that two-dimensional geometry chart, which come in at 425, but they also specify them what the bike is like at SAG. Now, the reason this is so pertinent is because if you have a very rearward axle, then it's only gonna tell half the story, isn't it? Because you might think, look at that, and I would look at that and go, cool, blimey O'Reilly, that's got short chainstays. But the kinematics of a bike are a very complicated thing. And if your rearward axle path, you know, is going, straight out back, then it's going to be changing that rear centre. I would suspect it does have quite a rearward axle path, being that it does have that idler going around um, and is, you know, a high single pivot. I mean, it looks, like I said, absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Now it is time to test your knowledge in this week's quiz. So the first question, okay, which of these bikes never had a place in Giant's off-road lineup? We have the Glory, the Faith, the Rain, and the Supreme. So which one has never featured in Giant's off-road lineup? Second question, what does POC stand for? P-O-C, the protective manufacturer. What does it stand for? And the last question is what was iDrive and what was the aim of the system? So tune in later on to find out the answers. Now it is time for top mods. So if you've got a great top mod and you want to send it into the show, get in the upload link below and hopefully we can feature it. So the first example of an absolute textbook execution of a top mod this week is from Trent in Nova Scotia, Canada. And basically he got this used Da Vinci frame. And I mean, you know, I mean, it looked like in all right shape, but he went absolutely to town. He's roared it out. It looks fantastic. And the, you know, the decals have been done, or decals have been done very tastefully indeed. And the end result looks, I mean, as factory fresh. Also, he's also got some nice touches, like, you know, the floating rotors, which have that kind of red core. We've got the seat clamp. We've got all sorts of stuff. And honestly, I don't think I would trust myself to make such a good job 
of the alignments of the stickers. I think I'd be all over the place. But honestly, this is really, really smart indeed. Loads of nice touches. You've got the chain ring, you've got the crank boots, grips. You know, it is very nice indeed. And now it looks like an absolute trail ripper. So uh, yeah, that is impressive. I want to uh, roar a frame soon. I just need to uh, get my A into G really, but it looks really, really top job. And the next submission we have this week is actually just a little bit different. So uh, everyone's got different ways of moving their bike should they be driving to the trails. I am the proud owner of the world's smallest van, the HMS Bipper, which just fits a bike in. I mean just, but it does so because it's so short. When I close the door, it jams the wheel and jams the bike upright. It's quite an elegant system. Somebody who's decided to take matters into their own hands, however, is Stephen from Bangor. And I mean, this is very tidy indeed. So basically, he's got a, what looks to be kind of a collapsible T-frame and has put uh, some axle mounts in there and also a really nice touch is that sort of casing around where the bottom bracket rests to keep the chain off the floor. And it just goes right in the back of his car. I mean, that is very nice. Like, to be honest, seeing it now, it doesn't look like the boot would close, but I've got a feeling, unless this is, this is an extraordinary bluff, and the reason you've got, you haven't showed us the boot closes because actually it doesn't fit, but I've got a feeling it probably does fit. And it looks like a very good job indeed. Going for that ratchet around that strap around to hold the forks a bit lower, which is actually <laughs> something I've seen other people do. But um, on like long travel bikes to steepen up the head tube on long gravel climbs, take a strobe toe strap in the pocket. Bob's your uncle, but um, not as quite as refined as Stephen here, which is a fantastic top mod, I've got to say. Very impressed indeed. So thank you very much for sending those in and on with the show. Okay, now it's time for Rewind. This, of course, is our retro portion of the show. If you've got any old school mountain biking gear, we would love to hear from you. There's a link at the bottom of the screen here, and you can also send us some messages, and you can get in touch in the comments underneath. Use that hashtag Rewind. Uh, this week, this is just unreal, off the chart. So Jason McCoy, legendary mountain bike racer, uh, late racer from the UK, RIP Jace. Uh, this is a replica of his bike with some of his kit here. So this is from John in East Yorkshire. Now I'm pretty sure I saw this bike at the Mulvans a couple of years ago. I'm hoping um, I might see it again this year if Mulvan still happens. Please, fingers crossed, um, the country gets back on track uh, in a safe way, of course. But check this out, oh man. So it's a 1995 Specialized S-Works M2 team. Um, almost completed the spec of my replica of Jason's bike from the 1995 film Dirt. Absolute iconic bike, an iconic film as well. It was on a retro bike stand in 2018 next to the booth of Jason's original bikes in which Doddy had a look at and pictured, yeah. Um, so it is the bike I, I referenced, amazing. Uh, I commented on the bike too. It's now got um, correct wheels, hubs, tires. Rear is uh, new old stock, great avid brakes, new old stock XTR mech too. Brilliant, lovely to see that. Uh, thought you might like to see it with the old memorial banner from his crash site donated to me by his dad. Um, yeah, that's that's really cool. Do you know what? I've never actually been up there. Um, if I do, I'll be sure to sort of pay my respects. Um, yeah, wow. I mean, look at it. So two old race jerseys as well with the Hardesty logo on. Amazing. Yeah, of course. So he used to race for Hardesty Cycles. That, of course, is when he really made a name for himself when he went on that famous USA trip. Um, if you've seen that video I made recently with Miles Rockwell's old Yeti bike, Jason's also in that video in the Hardesty kit. Uh, of course, he was still sponsored by Hardesty Cycles, which was one of his locals up in Newcastle. I think it's from Washington up there. Um, and he later went on to ride for Specialized, which was a big deal. And there's the bike itself. Look at it. it just looks awesome. So Odyssey triple track pedals, the red DCD on there, Dave's chain device, specialized tires, the specialized Judy forks. So it's a Rockstar Judy with the uh, carbon lower legs on those. Man, it's just beautiful, isn't it? So it's got the nice uh, Azonic Shorty stem, which was very short back then, but that's probably what, 75 mil? Um, not so short by today's standards, hey, but um, a three inch rise bar, the X-ray grip shift there with a green colored grip on there and the yellow grips to sort of go against that, the red Avid Speed Dial levers. Mate, it, it's just beautiful. Yeah, I do totally remember seeing the bike um, amongst JMC's ones. Yeah, it looks fantastic. And you've done an amazing job on that. That really is a great rebuild. 
very cool to see. Yeah, so it's got the DT Huiji rear hubs, which became DT Swiss later on. Avid speed dials, uh, levers. What are the, uh, I can't remember what the counter levers are called. I've totally got a brain block, but they were Avid's as well. Um, looking mega, aren't they? Look at the condition of it. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, there's that rear derailleur. Man, it's so nice. Mavic 121 SUP ceramic rims. Obviously the SUP were the uh, premium rims by Mavic, of course. So they're pinned together, they're welded, and then they're machined down for a perfect finish. And as a wheel builder, some of the nicest wheels, uh, rims to lace up because they're dead straight, uh, really easy to get good tensioning on, uh, unlike many other rims out there on the market. But uh, yeah, Mavic have it going on. Oh man, really, really cool. Yeah, and of course there's that specialized front tire as well. Super nice. Um, thanks for sending that in. I do remember the bike, John. Uh, hopefully we'll meet uh, at this year's Mulvans if it goes ahead. Uh, if not, in due course, I'm sure. Um, if you see me before I see you, please say hi. Uh, next up is from uh, Ryan in Pittsburgh, um, USA. Amazing. Great, so there's another Specialized. This one's a Stumpy. Oh, it's got the Onza sticker on the top tube there. It matches in perfectly. Um, I love the Rewind portion of your show so much. Oh, thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. Um, I, I clearly love Rewind stuff tonight. It's all I ever talk about, it seems to be these days. So I had to share this near, near Mint original 1993 Specialized Stump Jumper I recently acquired. Everything works perfectly. She shifts like a dream. Even has the original ground control front and uh, and more extreme rear tire. I totally forgot about the rear tire. I remember the ground control. Um, amazing. Oh, look at it. So nice. Love how simple bikes look then. Even though I do prefer the look of the sort of the riser bars, I love the simplicity of a straight bar with a stem like that. It just looks right. So proper period spec on there. Oh, super nice. So nice to see a couple of great specialized bikes there. Now you might notice I have this power post here. I'm going to tell you about this next week because uh, the guy that sent me this, he's also sent in some really cool stuff. I'm just waiting to have a chat to him about that before I show you on the show. But um, I'm actually looking for some 1993 components and I'm really struggling at the moment. Um, I'm actually going to try and find a bike that I can use as a donor to take the stuff off to build my amp up. I've been doing a bit of work trying to get the frame back to good condition. But um, I'm coming up. I want some underbar shifters. I don't want thumb shifters on it because I think the spec I want to go for is uh, the latter end of 93 when people were using underbars. Uh, any pointers anyone has would be great. Um, got a small bit of budget to spend on the bike. And I would love to like build it up for the channel and see if we can get it together and actually use it this year. It'd be really cool. Um, give me some pointers if you've got any. If not, see you next week. Cheers, guys. Now it is time for Bike Gabe. So this is where we get to have a nosy around wherever you store your bikes, be it the shed, garage, under the stairs, wherever. So if you've got your own Bike Gabe submission, get it into the upload link below and hopefully we can feature it on the show. But on with this week's. The first submission is from Ron, again in Canada. And he says, hey guys, just moved into a smaller home and had to downsize my workshop. This space has a triple duty space, my cars, bikes, and tools, and they have to have the space to do the work. I mean, it looks very, you know, if that's downsizing, hell's teeth. I, I, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of space, but it looks really, really good. You've got the blacked out workbench which is a very nice touch indeed and I like that that drill holder which looks like maybe you jigged up yourself but looks very functional indeed god, oh my god you've got a lot of kit looks like you did a bit of wheel building you've got a dishing tool the truing stand some heavy duty tools as well you know the big headset presses things like that which are normally considered more specialist um, bits of kit lovely I like anyone that's got organized trays like those boxes I'm in for. Although I do have to hmm, query whether these, these pliers live like this here, Ron. I mean, that is, come on, that's, that's, I'd, I'd be very happy if that's how you'd find them on a normal, you know, if I had a skirt around normally, because that's impeccable. I mean, it's all actually impeccable to be fair. It probably is like that all the time. But um, also a nice touch of the cotton swabs or cotton buds. Such a useful bit of kit, uh, working on pistons, on brakes, etc. They are really, really, really good. So, um, no, lovely, lovely workshop in general. I've got to say that is the envy of many. Really, really nice. 
Nosier bikes. Ooh, an intense fan I see. Cool. Oh, I see, so he has to reverse his bike in there, his car in there. But then again, I think, you know, that's still a decent amount of space. Although it always does worry me, you know, you know, accidents happen with bikes and they've got big chunky pedals on and rotating the cranks and a nicely painted mini, you know, it would be an awful shame. Nicely painted two minis. Anyhow, so on to the next submission from Simon and it is super cool. And it's something I'm very curious about because it's something I would love to do one day myself. I think it looks to be a shipping container that he is cladded and then kitted out internally. I mean, from the inside, it looks like a laboratory of some kind. It looks absolutely immaculate. The lighting is fantastic. Everything is so neat. I also love you've got some of the metallic tr um, magnetic trays on the side, which are very, very useful. And he's got all his moto kit in there, it looks like. I mean, it's one. It's like a palace more than a bike cave. Looks, he said, you know, he's had a few issues with people breaking in in the past of his previous setup. So now this one is like Fort Knox and it does look very good. It looks really, really tidy. Like I said, I'd, I'd love something like that. Very light, a lot of room and um, yeah, nice indeed. So on to the last submission this week, which is from Steve. And interestingly enough, he sets quite a high bar for himself by titling it my own Banksy. So I'll let you guys beat the sizes of that, but I think he's actually done a pretty solid job. Just stenciling on his wall, painting, and um, yeah, looks really good. It's far, far better than I could do, to be fair. And um, yeah, no, it's good to see somebody with some artistic license snazzing up their bike cave a bit, because honestly, that's a solid job. Banksy is world-renowned artist. Paintings go for the millions. It's a high, you've set a high bar. This is good. I'm not, not disparaging that, but you know. Anyhow, if you've got your own submission, guys, get them into the upload link below and hopefully we can feature it on the show. Cheers, guys. Okay, so now we're jumping back into the quiz section. This is where I give you the answers. So first question from Henry earlier in the quiz was, which of these bikes never had a place in Giant's off-road lineup? The Glory, the Faith, the Rain, or the Supreme? Did you just get that right? That's right, it's the Supreme. The Supreme is actually by Common Sale. Of course, so the Rain was their enduro bike, the sort of six inch travel bike, the Glory, the downhill bike, and the Faith, that was one of their older free ride bikes. Um, kind of interesting, it sold pretty well by all accounts. Next up was, what does POC stand for? This one even stumped me. I had to double check this was right because it didn't sound right to me. But it stands for piece of cake. Uh, the owner at the time, his children were getting into skiing and stuff, and he was like, I need some decent protection for them. Should be a piece of cake really, shouldn't it? And well, it was. <laughs> uh, next up was what was iDrive and what was its aim? So iDrive was invented by GT's designer, Jim Busby. And it's called Independent Drivetrain. Uh, and you guessed it, it was a way of making the drivetrain independent from, independent from the front and the rear parts of the bike. So it's isolated from pedaling and suspension forces. Uh, really incredible system. When it first came out, no one really knew what was going on because it was so it was hidden away. And the bottom bracket was basically housed inside a rotating bearing, and that bearing was mounted via a dog bone uh, to the front triangle, which could control how much it moved. Uh, it was kind of a strange system because as you went for the travel, you'd see it moving very slightly independently of the front and rear triangles, but it worked so well. Uh, of course, the earliest designs, uh, they moved on and they altered designs, so they used less moving parts over the years. It became more of an external looking device with a dog bone on the outside rather than on the inside using a key style fitting. Uh, really, really cool. And in fact, GT's third video on their suspension evolution is actually up on YouTube. I'm gonna put a link to it in the description underneath this. And there's a bit of information about the iDrive on there and just how much it changed the world of mountain biking at the time. Very cool stuff. Um, hopefully it's giving you some good pub knowledge for when we do finally be allowed back in the pubs to talk bikes with our mates. Uh, better still around the trails. See you later guys. And that is it for another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Thank you very much for watching. And don't forget to like and subscribe to help support the channel, as well as making sure you never miss a beat. Thanks for watching guys, and we'll see you next time.